Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. The tragedy of a childhood brain tumor didn't allow precious Olivia Caldwell to see her second birthday. Almost immediately though, her mother, Katie Caldwell Burchette, began working to fund life-saving research to find a cure for pediatric brain and other childhood cancers. Next on Wyoming Chronicle, the incredible story of the Olivia Caldwell Foundation and the Wyoming influence on Dr. Nick Borman and his life-saving work at Children's Hospital Colorado. Funding for this program was provided by the members of the Wyoming PBS Foundation. Thank you for your support. It's our pleasure on Wyoming Chronicle now to be joined by Katie Caldwell Burchett. Katie, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. You're sure welcome. You describe yourself as a wife and a mother and a cancer advocate, and we'll get to the cancer advocate in just a moment. But first, tell us about when you became a mother. I became a mother to my twins, Wyatt and Olivia. Um, they were born a little bit early and they made me a mom, which was the most beautiful thing in the world. But when, um, but when my kids were about four months old, my daughter was diagnosed with cancer, which changed everything about how my motherhood was gonna go. And it took you a little bit of time to get that diagnosis. And we wanna talk about in just a little bit what happened after Olivia passed away, but you had a battle until almost her second birthday. Yes, we did. Um, so she was diagnosed at four months old, and that was after months of knowing that something was not right with my little girl. She never was developing the same way that her brother was. Um, her infant startles returned. Her eyes were bouncing back and forth. She slept all the time. It didn't seem like she could see me. And it was so frustrating because I would call her pediatrician and say, I think something's wrong. And it was always just, oh, well, it's because she was born prematurely or it was because she has acid reflux or something. And it wasn't until she was having full blown seizures that we were sent down to have um, an MRI done and realized that she had a massive tumor in her brain and going down her spine. And so you immediately <clears throat> started treatment here in Denver at, at Children's Hospital Colorado. Yes. What did that entail? So it went on for about 16 months. She had two different battles with cancer. So the first bout, she battled for about seven months, went through very high intensity chemo. We lived in Denver every third week while she had three days of chemo, um, but the cancer did go away. And, and then- you were in Rollins at the time. We were, yes. <clears throat> and then just a couple months after the cancer went away, it came back with a vengeance. And, then, and you thought for that short period of time, things were gonna be okay? Yeah, we thought so. We thought we had gotten through it, she was gonna be okay. It was, had been a very treatable form of cancer. But the scary thing is once cancer comes back, it's usually very, very hard to treat. It's mutated, it's not going to react the same way again. And so hers just exploded and we had um, about four months of additional treatment and then um, it went very, very fast when she passed away. And she passed away at 20 months. She did, <clears throat> yes. I'm so sorry for that. Thank you. But what is so amazing to me is almost immediately you decided that her legacy would not be in vain. Yes. You started the Olivia Caldwell Foundation. Mm -hmm. What is that? So the Olivia Caldwell Foundation was founded just right after my little girl passed away. I had been her advocate. She had been my everything for her entire life, but especially those 16 months that she battled cancer. You know, I was with her for every single chemo treatment. I did all of her care. I was a stay-at-home mom. And when she was gone, it's just, I could not just turn that off. I had to do something to be able to remember her, to make sure her battle was not in vain. And so the foundation was something that just kind of came to me one day and I decided to jump in with both feet. But it's something you had never done before. It is not, yeah. <laughs> How did you learn to do that? Um, honestly, I bought How to Run a Nonprofit for Dummies books. So they really make a book with that title. They sure do, <laughs> yes. And you just started reading. I started reading. So during nap time, when Olivia's twin brother napped, I would read those books and highlight and think through everything, but I really just jumped in. With the first board that I had, we kind of learned on our feet and just got going. And before we get into that, you had told me earlier that your, your son, who wasn't yet two, almost understood when Olivia passed away. He did. 
Yeah, with them being twins, they always seem so connected. They seem to know what was going on with the other child, even though they were babies. My son, the night that she passed away, wasn't feeling well and went to bed really early. And he was sound asleep at the moment that Olivia took her last breath. And when she did, my son cried out from his crib and he never looked for her again, which was amazing because prior to that, the first thing he did when he woke up in the morning was, where's my sissy? And he'd go and he'd bang on her door to wake her up. But he knew, he's always known that she wasn't here anymore. So you started working on a foundation. Yes. What, was, what was your initial goal? What, what difference did you want to make? We wanted to help fund pediatric cancer research. Um, one of the things that we didn't know until I had a daughter who was sick with cancer was how prevalent cancer is and how severely underfunded it is. So once you found out about that, it's like, well, okay, I need to, I need to do something about this. And so we anticipated that we would never be able to raise very much. We thought, oh, maybe we can fund, you know, one project here or there every year, never imagining what it could grow into. You had written one time that your daughter should be here, mm -hmm. but she isn't. Yeah. Your work, your, your work already has made a difference. Tell us what's happened. So one of the really amazing <clears throat> thing that's happened is that they actually found the cure for my daughter's cancer. I got the news this last year, actually on the anniversary of the day I was told she wasn't going to make it, that they now, if she was diagnosed with the same cancer today, would be able to save her life. And that was using the funding that we gave for that research project. So I should tell our viewers that you have raised well over $300,000, mm -hmm. but it's just not that you've been able to leverage that money. We absolutely have. So we decided that it made the most sense to fund one research team, because otherwise if you get into having people apply for grant funding, your money becomes so spaced out, it can't make as big of a difference where we can give one large check to one research team that we really believe in, who is one of the top pediatric neuro-oncology labs in the entire United States, if not the world. And we can give them this money and then say, go run. You can use your brilliant minds to go down the avenues that you wanna go down instead of us making them go through the grant process every year. And we're here in the lab, University of Colorado mm -hmm. Children's. What do you feel when you come here? It's amazing. You know, I come here at least a couple times a year and the the amazing part of being here never it never goes away. Every time I walk in and I realize that there are these incredible people who are here working every single day trying to find the cure for these kids who desperately need it. You raise money. You work hard at raising money. Yes. What are the challenges that you've encountered in Wyoming and doing what you're doing now? You live in Casper. Yes, we do. So we relocated the foundation to Casper um, almost five years ago. So just really shortly after we had initially founded it in Rollins. And the challenge is that there are so many incredible nonprofits in the area. And so you're, you're fighting for funding. Everybody has a worthy cause and you have to prove why yours is worthwhile to also support. So that's one of the challenges, but we also have such an amazing giving community in Casper and in Wyoming that we found that we are very well supported and people have really bought into our mission and what we do and they're willing to help. What do people, how do people react when you tell them Olivia's story? So a lot of times there's tears. <laughs> very often I get hugs and, and, and tears. Um, it's a sad story, but it's not an uncommon story, unfortunately. There are a lot of our local children in Wyoming who've had cancer and many of them have not survived. Was it hard for you being in Rollins, not central to this wonderful hospital and research facility, mm -hmm. that had to have been difficult. It was very difficult. It was very difficult. We spent so much of our time on the road. We were traveling constantly. You know, we had support. We were able to make it work, but still, we were out of work every third week. Um, there were times that we were down here for three weeks or a month at a time if she was hospitalized, when she was newly diagnosed, when she was diagnosed again. So you're living in hotels with your family, you're living in condos, um, you're packing up everything that you own. There's no stability there in a time that's already incredibly stressful. You manage through that process. And you wanna make it, one of the things you wanna make a difference with, with the foundation maybe, is having more clinics in Wyoming and maybe even mm -hmm. Casper. Yes. So one of the really exciting things that we have been working on is actually opening a pediatric specialty care clinic in Casper. So it would be for all of the state of Wyoming. It would bring up specialists from Denver on a regular basis to see kids where they live. And maybe this 
will not just address childhood cancers, but maybe other diseases as well. Yeah, they're talking about pulmonology, cardiology, endocrinology. Eventually, we'd really like to be able to serve a lot of children. Katie, what advice would you have for parents that have endured what you've endured? Um, it's impacted your life. It mm -hmm. impacted your marriage. Mm -hmm. What would you tell folks that are, that are really wrestling now maybe with something in their family? I would say just to take the time to enjoy what you can about your life. Some really, really sad, horrible things have happened to me and to my family. And losing my daughter was a terrible thing. But I'm really happy that I took that and made it into something positive. I get to keep being her mom. I get to make sure that her name is known. And it gives me purpose. It makes it feel like what happened to my little girl was not in vain. And it helps me so much with my grief because I have somewhere to channel it that's not a negative place. And this happened a few years ago, and yet still you do have grief that you have to deal with. Yeah, it never goes away. <clears throat> you know, the cycles of grief are a real thing. It's not, you don't go through them one time and then you're done and you're okay. It's a constant thing. There's so many anniversaries when you have a sick child. You know, you're looking at their birthday for one thing, and they're not here to celebrate it and with you. And you celebrate it with Olivia's twin. I do, still yes. Today. And we still we still acknowledge her on her birthday, but there's so many more anniversaries that aren't pleasant. You know, the time she was diagnosed with cancer the first time, the time she was diagnosed the second time, the day she died, the day I found out she was going to die. This, These are things that you live through year after year after year, and you just learn, you have to learn how to take those days and take care of yourself and know they're going to be sad. This is too difficult, let me know, but I want you to um, share with our viewers what, how you managed when you learned that your child wasn't going to make it. Oh, it was devastating. Um, I think I went into just, a, it was not a real place for me at that point in time. I knew that she was going to pass away, but I don't think I fully accepted that for quite some time. I was trying to hold it together for my husband, for my son, and I don't think I really, really dealt with the fact that my daughter was going to die or that she had died for a couple of years. You were in hospice services at the time. Yes, so I was fortunate enough, one of my board members actually, um, at the time she was Olivia's nurse and she acted as our hospice nurse at home because otherwise there is no hospice care in Rollins we would have had to be at the hospital or I would have had to do her hospice care. Tell me more about the people who serve with you on the Olivia, Olivia Caldwell Foundation Board. I have a phenomenal board of directors. Um, some of them are relatively new, some are brand new, and some have been with me the whole time. So the board member I just mentioned, she was a founding board member, stepped right in and has been with me for almost all six years. But they're leaders in our community, most of them have never been personally touched by childhood cancer, and yet they are huge advocates. They work so hard. In addition to their powerful careers, they, they give their all. You had mentioned earlier that perhaps if Olivia were born today, she may have survived the cancer that mm -hmm. she had. But you've learned there is so much more work to do. Absolutely. The work is far from over. They have found cures to a couple different types of cancers, but there are so many more. There are thousands more that are not curable yet. There are some that are 0%. It's a 0% survival rate. And when you look at it that way, it's, there's just so much more that has to happen. We are not done. In just a moment, we're going to visit with a doctor who treated Olivia, Dr. Mm -hmm. McCormick, who you still have a great relationship with today. In fact, this lab is here because of him. Yes. Introduce him for us. So Dr. Nick Foreman was Olivia's doctor. He took care of my baby girl for 16 months. He fought so hard to be able to save her and we've continued to work with him. So he actually established the Pediatric Neuro-Oncology Department at Children's Hospital Colorado and has this amazing lab that's one of the largest in the United States. And he works so hard, so tirelessly for all of his patients, for all of the kids that he doesn't know whose lives he's trying to save. It's, he's an amazing man. Katie, it's just been great getting to know you and your staff, Summer, who's with us off camera. We wish you nothing but the best. Thank and we you. hope you have a lot of great success in the future. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much. And as we continue on with Wyoming Chronicle, as Katie introduced, it's our pleasure to be joined by Dr. Nick Foreman. Dr. Foreman, thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. You are the Seabomb Cheddar Chair of Neuro-Oncology 
here at uh, Children's Hospital Colorado, and you're also on the faculty, you're professor of pediatrics at the University of Colorado. Welcome. Thank you. You worked with Katie and you worked with Olivia, and you have been now the benefactor of their foundation. What has Katie's work meant to you? Katie's work has been, and the money from her foundation has been really important in the work of finding new mutations in childhood brain tumors and finding very specific therapies for those mutations. We're here in a beautiful lab, and it's one of the leading labs in the country. Describe for us where we are. We're in the middle of one of the neuro-oncology labs. There are um, six neuro-oncology um, uh, uh, principal investigators, lead investigators here. And so the whole of this area is pediatric neuro-oncology. This is actually the largest research pediatric neuro-oncology group in the United States. I've read once where you said this, I've seen how things have improved over decades. You've been at this since the mid-1980s, I understand. And I remain optimistic that one day we will cure everyone. You believe that? I believe that. Um, but I would also like to achieve curing everyone without the current cost that a lot of the children bear. So there, there are two problems in treating um, children with brain tumors. We have increased the cure rates very dramatically. Um, but we don't cure all children with all tumors. And the other problem is a lot of these children grow up injured by our therapies and their quality of life is poor. We talked off camera and let's talk about it now. There are some smarter therapies that you're helping to develop. Yes, so um, t tumors are driven by often in childhood single mutations. So it's a single damaged gene. And that single damaged gene is what's driving the tumor. So rather than actually do something which affects the whole body, like give radiation or chemotherapy, the whole question is developing therapies directed specifically at that mutation. And that revolution in therapy has already arrived for a considerable number of children. Katie told us that through some of your research that she may be alive today and may have been a benefactor of exactly that type of treatment. Yes, she had an FGFR1 mutation, and that is actually something we can target now. So if you went back, and it's really fairly recent that we treated her, we had nothing except you know, chemotherapy at the time, which has, again affects the whole body, and was relatively ineffectual in that tumor. And so to actually now have these targeted therapies is really completely different. And these are pills. These are not, these are not therapies that have to be given in a clinic. These are not therapies where you have to have lines and IVs. So this is totally different. You've talked emotionally in the past about how you treat kids who have their lives in front of them, who you want to see graduate and get married. Some don't, you persevere. Yes, I, I actually do a long-term follow-up clinic following the children till they're, till they're young adults, till 26. And because we've been working here since 95 in the state of Colorado and treating children from all the surrounding states, including Wyoming, um, I have seen the results of what we do. And unfortunately, the results of uh, what we do are not always very pretty. So. It seems to me it's a big challenge for people that were in Katie's shoes, <clears throat> having to drive hundreds of miles year round to come to yeah. get the care that they need. Is that something, you talk about targeted therapies, which might be helpful to some, but is that still a big issue in our country? Uh, I think developing those targeted therapies is a really big issue um, because the actual number of mutations is actually quite large driving tumors. So um, although there are some that are relatively common, um, actually just describing them all is actually taking us a long time. So we've actually gone back through basically hundreds of tumors and actually look for the mutation again and again. And when we find a mutation, we then have to actually look at how to target it. So this is actually an enormous piece of work. And it's driven, um, uh, our work is now often 
resulted in national or um, participates in national trials so that we can actually look at the success of these targeted therapies very quickly. We hear in the media often that we're going to have a national charge and get, get after cancer. And then we hear that again. And now we've heard it again. Sure. Well, you, you have to remember that our situation is somewhat different to a lot of um, adult cancers. Your situation it, with pediatrics. With patients. pediatrics, because we've already got to a cure rate of roughly 70%, which is, you know, the work of a lot of people, including all the people in these labs, uh, since 85. So we already have a fairly high cure rate. The problem is our cure rate, roughly half the people who are cured are actually injured. <laughs> so, you know, that we want to push up the cure rate, but we also want to radically change the therapy. So for us, um, if you like, tomorrow is already here. You know, I see children every week now who we're actually treating with targeted therapy, who we're actually giving pills to, and we're not giving, um, we're not giving chemotherapy to. And those children having pills now are as far away as Kalispell up in, up in Montana, almost on the Canadian border, and all the way down in the south of New Mexico. So we are treating those children already. Um, what we really need to do is to make sure that therapy is available to everyone with every different mutation. And that is a tremendous bit of work. Is that a money challenge too? It's always a money challenge because there is always a limited amount you can do. And the, the other thing that people don't realize for um, as a money challenge, it's not just the research. It's the clinical trials that result from the research and how rapidly you can do them um, because they're expensive. <laughs> and mm -hmm. getting those, and in childhood, they all have to be done nationally to really work. And that is a major challenge all the time. But to circle back, here's Katie mm -hmm. on her own, has raised over $300,000 that she's leveraged into a couple yeah. million dollars that has been of direct benefit. Yes, absolutely direct benefit. So children with, I saw one just two weeks ago, a child with an FGFR1 uh, uh, mutated tumor, which actually involves the brain stem and the upper spine, which I would have said five years ago, absolutely fatal, is just been on pills now for 18 months and is doing just fine. So, so, you know, that change has actually arrived and that therapy we have given to people with an FGFR1. In fact, I think that was one of the first children ever treated and that, that child is doing fine. But that's now a therapy that's available nationally. Before we let you go, Dr. Foreman, you told us that there's some Wyoming funding that is prevalent right here in this lab. Well, it's not only Katie's funding, which is very important to us, but actually the, the sebum part of my chair, which actually uh, back in the early part of 2000s was one of the things that really got us started, is actually Wyoming money. It's actually derived from the McMurray family and from their selling for, of oil fields up in, up in Wyoming. So this is directly um, Wyoming money helped found this whole unit and Wyoming money Support actually produces the future. Yeah. Well, Dr. Nick Foreman, thank you so much for joining us on Wyoming Chronicle. We wish you the best of luck. You're one of the nation's best and thank you for spending time with us. Thank you very much. I'm Candice Frood and I am a founding board member for the Olivia Caldwell Foundation. And I was Olivia's nurse. So I first met Katie and Olivia when, they, when she and her husband brought the twins home from the hospital from being born. From the age of four months on, well, really from the age of bringing Olivia home, from being born prematurely all the way through her death, I watched that family struggle every single day. It was always one thing after another. It went from having to wean them off oxygen. It went through having a brain cancer diagnosis. It went through a period of remission, then it went through her having some health problems due to some medications she was taking, and ultimately the struggle of her passing away. One of the things that was 
always noticeable about Katie was she was always very strong in her faith. So things would happen and she would call and we would cry and yet we would pray and we would know that it was gonna be okay. We would go to church, we had support from family and friends and just would support her with whatever we could, but most of the time it was hard. She was always having to advocate. She was always having to fight because we lived in Rollins, Wyoming, and all of the care that Olivia needed was in Denver. So even though there was a lot of struggles, she really was always very good at being positive and always, always just wanted what's best for her children. The work that Katie has done with the foundation since Olivia passed in my eyes really defines the word perseverance. She has fought and worked to make Olivia's death not be in vain. So our hope for our foundation is to find a cure for pediatric cancer. We have made some amazing strides. And I think what people don't always realize is that if a Wyoming child gets diagnosed with cancer, a lot of times they're going to be going to Denver to be treated. And we have been able to provide some money for some really big startup projects and some really big outcomes have come out of that. And I think what the people of Wyoming don't realize is that you don't think about this until it's you or it's your family member, but it happens. And these children are being struck with cancer and there is not a lot of times not a cure. And our hope is to not only make a difference for any family that's going through this, but especially make a difference for our Wyoming families. Funding for this program was provided by the members of the Wyoming PBS Foundation. Thank you for your support.